welcome to uh, Big Boys to Cry, the African American Boys Experience. So let me ask you guys a question before I get started. When you saw the title, before you actually, or maybe you didn't read the blurb, because I know sometimes you just kind of scroll through and look at the titles, what was your first thought? I'm curious, what was everybody's first thought? It just sounded interesting to me. Okay. I wanted to not figure out why, but just to explore the ways to address African American health needs. Okay. Anybody else? I didn't know that there was a <clears throat> that the African American male's experience was different than say my own because okay. boys don't cry. Right. Okay. Stigma. Okay. Stigma. Anybody else? <clears throat> Ruby, I'm supposed to be talking back to me. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, I swear the hour and a half will be so much more. <laughs> <laughs> I have five brothers, so I'm interested. Okay. Okay, so this topic is uh, very near and dear to me um, because I am a mother of four. I have three girls and one boy. Um, all my girls are currently away at college. They're 2019 and 18. And I have a son, he's a sophomore, he's 15, and he goes here mm -hmm. to Upland. So um, you guys are very near and dear to me because a lot of you um, engage with my son on a daily basis. So. It's funny because my kid, because I am a therapist, um, you know, he tends to be my experiment. Um, <laughs> all of my kids, actually, the three girls and him, but specifically him because I am, I am female, right? I am a woman. So with my daughters, like, I relate to them, of course, a lot better and a lot easier. I wouldn't say better, I would say easier. With my son, it is definitely a challenge because I have to kind of step into the mindset of not only being a, a boy, but being an African American boy in this day and age, okay? So this is our baby. <laughs> this is, that's the baby, okay? Um, so when I was invited to speak, um, I decided that I didn't want to just educate you on the topic. I wanted to have a conversation, right? And I'm all about the mind shift, right? I want you to be able to shift the way you see things, okay? So I want to read you uh, a couple of things. Um, so I'm a mother first, right, and a clinician second, okay? And as a mother of an African American male, I often find myself fearing for his future, not because he's been in a lot of trouble or because he has a disability that makes him a target in order to be publicly ridiculed, but because sometimes when the world sees him, they don't see the baby of our family. They don't see the young man that wants to be a pilot and an aeronautical engineer. When he's upset, they see anger. And when he's really upset, they see a threat. So as a mother and a clinician, it is my job to have more of a conversation and a dialogue about the mind shift, okay? Because in order to shift the narrative and expand people's perspectives, we have to be able to see our babies for who they are, as opposed to, you know, what the world has uh, made them out to look like. So when you see my baby, what do you think? Not like, is he handsome or cute? <laughs> <laughs> so I think he's handsome and cute. But, 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 but what do you see? Comfortable. And he's comfortable. What else? He looks happy. Innocent. 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 I feel like I need to go to the whiteboard and start writing some of these down. <laughs> what else? God fearing, because uh, his class is happy. Okay. He's got some sweat. <laughs> <laughs> Confident. Confident. Right. Mini version of yourself. The mini version of me. And his dad, who's happened to be over there. <laughs> All right. My heart is like a struggling tree on its last limb surrounded by deforestation. Jalen Burrell. That's my son. So I, you see the picture, and you read the quote. Now what do you think? Lonely. 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 Yeah. What else? Isolated. Isolated. Mm -hmm. Broken. Broken. Seeking his own identity. Seeking his own identity. Remember I said my kid is an experiment, plus I, he gave me permission. <laughs> but I showed you the picture first, 
And I gave you this because I wanted you to understand that this was three years ago, about two and a half years ago. This is how he was feeling. And so that picture was over the summer. So we've made progress. But this is where he was two and a half years ago. Right? And so when we see things like this and we hear things like this, first of all, as a mother, like when he shared this with me, I was like, oh, there's some things that we need to talk about. Right? So today I'm going to talk to you more as not as just educators, but just as adults working with children. And then I also want you to go back to when you felt somewhat similar to this as a child. Right? So when you felt this way as a child, what were some of the things that were going on? You don't have to necessarily share, but I'm just kind of asking you to think about some things. What was going on where you felt like you were struggling on your last one? Where you felt like everything around you was dying? Where you felt like <clears throat> hopeless, helpless, right? Because this is the thing. If you look at oh, backwards, why are you not cooperating? If you look at that, you would never think the other is going on, would you? Because we didn't either as parents, right? As parents, we did not think that this was how he was feeling until we gave him a safe space to express it. So what's the point of all this today? Right? So here we talk about safe spaces. So the creation of opportunities and safe spaces for African American males to openly and comfortably express when they're not okay. Experiencing depression, anxiety, or upset regarding the social inequalities they are subjected to. So let's break this one down, right? How often, and it's just as adults, right? How often are you comfortable with saying that you're not okay? Not as often as I should. Right, because being not okay means what? Oh. Or you're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm a therapist, not supposed to use the word crazy, but <laughs> right? Or you're crazy, right? Because you're not okay. What's wrong with you? You're weak. You're weak, right? So when you go back to the picture of my son, like if I showed you a picture of him two and a half years ago, you would think, oh, he's okay, right? But he wasn't. So when we're not okay, we still look good, right? We get up, you know, we put our clothes together, make sure we style our hair, right? But we're not okay on the inside. So how do we express depression and anxiety when we can't even say we're okay? Did you notice that I, I, I went through the levels of severity? Like if you can't even say you're okay, how do you say you're depressed? How do you say you're anxious? How do you say you're upset about walking out into a world that looks at you and judges you based on what you look like. How do you tell people you're upset about that if you can't even say you're okay? Yeah, so what do you mean? Right? So, let me ask you guys. When you experience depression and anxiety, what does that look like? When people experience depression and anxiety, what does that look like? Huh? They withdraw. So we start to isolate. Yeah. You nervous. Behavior changes. Huh? Your, your typical behavior changes. Right. It was talking about like the, the sky's falling. Like nothing right. seems to be yeah. right. 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 But what about when you're a kid and you don't know how to express it in those terms? You act out. You act out. <laughs> what happens when the things that are going around you? When the shootings that are going on and little boys that look like you are being killed and so you're afraid to walk to the park or you're afraid to go to Ontario Mills or you're afraid to walk at Victoria Gardens, right? How do you express these things as a child, as a boy? 
internalize it. You internalize it, you build a wall. Or remember when I said how when you're upset, you're called angry, and when you're really upset, you're looked at as a threat. So if you can't say you're okay, and when you are upset, you're, you're titled angry and aggressive, right? How do you express these things? How do you talk about them? You don't. They don't. And then when we say, don't cry, right? So my mom does childcare, and uh, she's been doing it for about 20 years. And so dads will come in, you know, and their son like got a boo boo or an owie or something. And you know, they're like, dad, I'm just, and dad is like, boy, don't cry. Rub some dirt on it, you'll be <laughs> right. Well, or you get the mom that says, suck it up, buttercup. Right? And it's like, wait a second. Like, it hurts. Why can't we cry? Because we teach them very early. Don't cry. Why? I was in church yesterday, and uh, my son was sitting next to me. And so, you know, people were crying, and so they're passing around tissue. And he made the comment, he was like, you know, Mom, I've been to like a lot of your conferences, and I noticed that you don't pass around tissue. And I was like, you're right. And he was like, why? He was like, in church, you know, they're constantly passing around the tissue box. He was like, you'll sit it, like in my office, it's sitting in my office. I never offer it to a client. If I, if I host a workshop or a conference, I never offer them. They're sitting, so you can see them, they're visible, but we believe in letting the tears flow. Why do you guys think that is? It's healing. It's healing. And also because you're constantly told not to cry, and if you're this age and you're told not to cry, it's kind of like my job to reverse that mindset that it's not okay to cry. All right, so what is the goal? Do I have to read them all? How about you guys read them? Let's make them interactive. <laughs> Hey, over you. Okay. Yeah. Teach the adults how to see past their actions and determine if they're struggling with depression, <clears throat> anxiety, or situations that cause frustration. Okay. And if you guys are teachers in here, please don't correct the grammar. <laughs> <laughs> can I get someone else to read over the second one? You can just read it. Teach the adults to not dismiss their feelings by labeling them as angry, hostile, or aggressive. Next one. Teach the adults to encourage them to speak their truth and express what they're feeling and why. And the last one. Empower students to advocate for themselves by being equipped with the ability to communicate their feelings in times of despair and conflict. What if I told you I didn't come up with not one of those? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> who, who, who does that voice sound like? My son, his friends, my daughters kids that I work with, right? I ask them because, see, I don't want to speak for them. That's not my job. It's not my job to speak for them. It's my job to advocate for them, right? I create a safe space. Remember we talked, I talked about safe spaces in the beginning? We want to create opportunities and safe spaces for them. So I ask them. What do you want the adults to know? How do you want them to assist you? What are you looking for? What do you need? Right? I, I love, and this is my sarcasm, guys, because I don't love it, but I love how we come up with these initiatives based on what the adults think. And you always wonder how many children were asked Right, think about the initiatives that come down, right? How many of them you think the children have been asked what they need? How they respond? Do we usually ask the children? Or do we just kind of think we know what's best for them? Because remember, I'm a therapist, so I thought I knew my kids. I thought I knew that I would be able to recognize that um, and all my kids have been in therapy for multiple reasons. So my, my three oldest, the girls, none of them are my biological children. So let me give you a little bit of background. 
um, leading up to how this came about even with my son. So my oldest is my goddaughter. She came into my life when she was about nine months old. And then the second oldest girl, the 19-year-old and the 18-year-old, they both went to my mom's childcare. And then both their moms died. Not the same mom, but different moms. And they were best friends with my oldest, right? So at the time when the 19-year-old's mom died, she was 10. My daughter was 11. So that would make my son, help me do the math, y'all. Five, they're five, my oldest and youngest are five years apart. Like six? Six. six. So my, my youngest was six. So he saw this, right? He knew Janine. Like Janine was special to him, right? She came to the daycare every day. Now, my daycare was at my house too. So that meant that my son had all these people. And so then Janine dies when he's six, right? And so the youngest, my youngest daughter is 18. Her mom died when she was 12. So my son at that time was eight, right? So he saw that and she died of cancer, right? She was a daycare mom. So she came every day to my home and she called him Jay, her little Jay. And every Wednesday, because um, her and my mom were very close, they would have like soup plantation night or they would all go out to dinner or different things like that. So this became his routine, right? So he's already watched Janine pass away and her daughter her struggle, right? And then his oldest sister um, was trying to be there for the younger ones, but she's 12 and 14 at the time, so her ability to be there is a little more difficult. But he's watching all of this, right? I forgot to mention that my best friend um, was in a near-fatal motorcycle accident when my son was seven and him and his wife almost died, okay? So again, all of this is going on, right? And so after Vicki passed away, this is my youngest daughter's mom, um, my children became inseparable, almost enmeshed to a point, because that's how they survived. That's how they got by. And then all of a sudden, they're all gone. Mm. So the oldest has gone off to college, and so he's got two sisters left. And the next one leaves off to college, got one sister left and the third one is gone at this point and so now he's alone and it's interesting because um, he was probably happiest in that picture because we were all together mm -hmm. and so now as uh, this adjustment period is coming I find myself having to kind of reiterate some of the same things from two and a half years ago when he finally came out and said I'm struggling right so now I find myself now, today, every day, constantly working with him to ask him, what do you need? Because there were times where his grades were slipping, right? Not because he has any type of learning disabilities, but because he's sad. How do children learn when they're sad? They don't. How do they learn when they're anxious? How do they learn when they're depressed? So they act out, right? So a lot of the kids that I work with, um, and I also worked in a group home for many, many years. And so this is my babies. This is what they're crying out for. This is what they need. So how do we give it to them? How do we give them this? How do we see past their actions? Right? You got the little, you know, I was in church yesterday and, you know, my mom does daycare, so I got to think about unruly kids. Sometimes I just be like, ooh. But then the other side of me thinks, what's going on with this kid? Where you got a seven-year-old that's just all over the place. And I don't mean just like the regular running around, playing Batman and Spider-Man. My son used to walk around telling people to spidey everybody. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about literally just destructive. So normally when we see that, what do we think? Parents not doing what they're supposed to do. Right. But what if we took it a step further and thought about, are their parents even there? Right. Uh -huh. Do we usually think that? What's usually the go-to when you have a disruptive kid? Is it? Do you see past the actions and wonder if they're struggling with depression, anxiety, or situations at home? <clears throat> 
Or do we immediately go to wanting to correct the behavior? Right? We want to correct the behavior. Right? Do we, and then say, say we don't want to correct the behavior. Say we do see past the actions, right? How do we not dismiss their feelings? How do we not use the words angry, hostile, or aggressive? Right? I sat in on many IEPs with, with my clients and their children. And when I see these words, like, listed, I'm like, whoa. And I always lean to the, turn to the parent and say, this is how they see your child. This is how they see your child. So if this is how you see a child, because you can't get past their actions, how do you encourage them to speak their truth? Like, how do you do that? By giving them the space to encourage them. To but, but don't we first have to not judge, and don't we first have to not dismiss their feelings? Don't we have to learn that part first? So how do we do that? How do we do that? Talk to the kids. But, but, you, but you're busy. You got 30, 32 kids. You teach in four and five mm -hmm. sections, classes. Right? How do you do that? You're busy. You're tired. You got your own stuff going in your life. They get sent to the counselor. They get sent to the counselor. <laughs> but the counselors, a lot of are, a lot of them are they even clinically trained? I am. <laughs> but what about but what about when they're not? Because we don't have that on every campus. We don't have that on every campus. We don't have. We don't. So what if you don't have a clinically trained counselor on campus? What if you model to them how to express their feelings? Oh, ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding, ding. Go take a look at I forgot my suckers. I have these like little world magic suckers. So, so remember what I said as an adult, right? We need to say we're not okay. So when the kid is in the classroom and they happen to catch, you know, our face, and it's not, it's not a cute face or a pleasant face, <laughs> and they call us out on it, why not be honest and say, yeah, today's just not a good day for me. Let them know, right? Because we need to model it for them, right? We need to let them know we're not okay so that they're comfortable with saying they're not okay, right? Because we don't want them to dismiss our feelings, so we don't want to dismiss theirs. That's interesting because we've been being told lately that your personal stuff, how you feel, you don't share that with the kids. As far as what? Give me a little bit more. Well, we, we took a training online, did we not? Is it okay to share, you know, that I had a fight with my wife this morning with the kids? Well, yeah. absolutely Maybe not. not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, or, you know, my kid's sick, or anything. It's not, that's, it, it's a perfect, what I got from that training was it is a professional relationship. When I was first came into this profession a thousand years ago, it wasn't. <laughs> It was, well, why do you think they've shifted it, was, it a little bit? Uh, lawsuits, mm -hmm. uh, uh, emphasis on um, achievement. Mm -hmm. You're talking about how test. That's what the emphasis is on. Mm -hmm. That it is about you being a professional mm -hmm. and making sure that they achieve. I didn't get the whole the whole child thing. Mm -hmm. It's this is when you make a referral and this is when you don't. Mm -hmm. And and that's the training that we have every year now. We go online and we go through this litany of scenarios. Who wrote the training? Do you know who it's the mandated reporter. Yeah, mandated reporter training. <laughs> <laughs> so so did, so did you guys get that too? And I believe you. Okay. But, but this is the thing though. So when the kids get referred to me, right now now it's kind of like I'm I'm a team of one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because. You know, if I reach out to the teachers for support, or the parents, or it, it, it's almost like I'm trying to say, I'm saying this, like, hey, you need to cry, you need to share, you need this, and everybody else is like, mom. So then what message are we sending to the kids? And I'm not saying walk in and say, the kid catches you, you know, looking 
not your best and you say, you know, me and my wife this and this and that and that. But just today's not a good day for me. Anybody else ever had a not good day? How have you handled it? How have you handled it? I, I have to model for a student who I know have conflicts and trouble in his life where he, um, he um, avoids doing his math. And so, um, you know, to kind of to fall asleep. And so I decided to, you know, become a model. And I did tell him, I hoped it would look, I said, I struggled with that so much. Even when I was going to college, struggle, struggle, struggle. <coughs> I, I, was I, would, I would get my papers back and turn it over. Because I see him with that. Turn my papers over. I put it in my backpack. So my, and I said, but I, and I said, I do it. And so um, then after that, then I said, if you can, you know, I asked the teacher if he can fall asleep. He wanted to fall asleep. And so I said, I'm going to take notes for you. And I took notes for him. And I hope this helped. It just it appeared that it helped. And then the rest of the day, he just regrouped. And he was just kind of alert in the rest of in, in the rest of his classes, and begged me for his notes. And I'm just thinking, if that was a good model, I'm hoping. I don't know. I did it for that day, and it just was it just recently. It helped him to um, be more alerted to get back on task. So, is that a model? I don't know. That is a model. But but you know what though? The best thing that I can just speak as a clinician, right? The best thing I can say to you from that mindset is meet them where they are. <laughs> meet them where they are, right? I know the mandated reporter and you know all these other forms of how to deal with our children are out there. And I will not, by any means, dismiss them and say that they're not important. But what I will say is on the other side of things, because I am a clinician, and I work with kids on a different level, I will say meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to, for lack of a better term, teach a kid the difference between feelings and actions? You can feel a certain thing. You can think a certain thing, but the proper behavior or the way to deal with that is not this way. Right. How do you do that? So, I always tell clients, children and adults, right? There's a difference between what you feel and what you know, mm -hmm. right? And so a lot of times we are reactionary people. We react to situations. Mm -hmm. We don't really stop to think, but even as adults, right? So it's harder to teach children because adults don't model it, right? So this is usually what I do with kids. A lot of times kids will come in, right? And, you know, either the principal or the teacher or someone has referred them or the parent comes in and says, literally, there's something wrong with my kid, I just need you to fix them. Like, this literally becomes, like, the thing, right? And so, a lot of times I ask the kid, what's going on? Like, what is going on? Like, where, where is the disconnect happening where you feel depressed and anxious or you feel like you're struggling with something or you're frustrated, but you're coming across to everybody looking angry, hostile, and aggressive. Like, where's the disconnect? Right? But a lot of the boys in the group home, specifically the African American boys, right, and the Latino boys, a lot of times when they're coming in to therapy, right, they've been bounced around from home to home, right? The school, you usually don't know if it's a group home kid. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't think you guys are really trained to be able to like identify. And, and they do normally have um, a certain style about them and the way they carry themselves. Right? They, they do. And so they're bounced around. And so, you know, they get to a new school. This is October. And they get to a new school. And you hand them whatever lesson is going on for the day. And they immediately look at it and go, oh. Right? And so the teacher looks and does what in that scenario? Well, what would the teacher do in that scenario? If the kid does what? If the kid just basically looks at what you hand them and just doesn't do it. Or they don't, or they don't even give it the time of day. They, they pull out their phone. They, they become just, I mean, however they let you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this. My first question is always like, are you like this one? Like, are you all right? I see you're not doing your work. Just to see, maybe I can... I don't know. Right. So you can offer some, some form of empathy 
regardless of how I feel. Um, that's what I'm trying to do. It doesn't always right. happen. But, no, that's so. your approach, but most of the time it's a mm -hmm. Most of the Okay. Yes. And that triggers, especially a group home kid, that's going to trigger them. Right. Because they already don't trust anymore. Right. So you're automatically constantly. And I promise I'll answer your questions. Just going all the way around to get there. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I just say figure it out. Do it. Do it. Uh, we got we to gotta go. You know. So, and that moment of everyone else go, you know, in the class, it's like. And you, so you know what's wrong with all what's wrong with that is that you got this kid who's been bounced around to four or five homes by the time they're eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and if you come at them with that with that approach, you're immediately gonna get a reaction as opposed to a response to how they're feeling. So when you ask how do you teach them to not be reactionary? And to, instead, you want them to be responsive. Mm -hmm. The way you teach that is the way you ask them what's going on with you. This, yeah, this, this wasn't from Kong Kid. I, I felt like I got a good response from him because I did ask him was he feeling well. And he did say, I'm, I'm, I don't, my stomach hurt him sleeping. Mm -hmm. And so I, got, I think I got a reaction from him. Right. To get into what Kong is doing. But you guys get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes, go on. I was just going to say, I'm at a small school, and I work with this here, and, we, um, and I'm a special ed, so mm -hmm. I, I sometimes am privy to using a group home, mm -hmm. and I notice that what they do is it's like it's a test to see if they can trust you, mm -hmm. because they just don't have... How can you trust? Right. It's like people in their lives, the adults who are providing care for them, mm -hmm. it's their job. It's mm -hmm. not like, you know, and I see... How they interact with peers. It's usually they're the ones that tend to quickly find a mate, mm -hmm. and they're just like super affectionate. If it's a young, a, a young man with the girl, and it's not in an inappropriate way, but it's like it was like Safe. kind of in comfort, comfort, right? You know, so that's something that I've observed. Right. So, so that that's how we do it, right? That's how we get them to be responsive instead of being reactionary. Right? Because remember, we got to think about why they're frustrated. We want to be able to see that they're struggling with anxiety, that they're struggling with depression. Right? We don't want to dismiss them and label them. And the only way to do that is to have a conversation with them as opposed to rectifying the behavior before we figure out what's going on. Big boys do cry, because everyone cries, right? Mm -hmm. Was the last time everybody had a good cry? Uh, <laughs> you don't have to answer the right one. I was kind of my father. Maybe I am sad. Maybe I am angry. 
maybe I am frustrated, right? And in order to be able to self-regulate and evaluate ourselves, one of the best ways to do it is when we cry. Because what is tears? As soon as you start to cry, what does it tell you? You can release. You can release and something's wrong. It's a way for us to recognize that there's something wrong, right? And then once we recognize there's something wrong, now we can move forward, right? Now we can move forward past the hurt, the disappointment, and the anger. Sorry. Um, so with this thing of letting kids cry, one of the things that I, in fifth grade, kids cry all the time. And so I'm kind of got into a habit the kids start crying. I'll say, go to the bathroom and, and take as long as you need. Just because I'm a, I don't want them to, you know, I don't want other kids to start giving their attention to them and then getting embarrassed. So okay. in those situations, I mean, is that okay? Or do yes. you think yes. you have to cry in front of everybody? Well, no, what I'm saying is, <clears throat> yes, encourage that they be expressive. And you don't want them, obviously, to become like the 20 minute right. display in the class. <laughs> Let them know that, hey, I, you know, it's okay for you to go ahead and, and you know, collect yourself and have a minute. Because everybody needs a moment, yeah. right? But what happens when, you know, someone's crying and you, your immediate response is to hand them a tissue and say, you know, come on, get it together, you know, you, you, come on. And it's like, why are we encouraging them to stop crying? Like, because that happens. I've been in classrooms and seen it, and I'm like, oh. Because the teacher views it as disruptive to the rest of the class. Yeah. That the focus of the lesson is no longer that. The focus of the people in the classroom is on the kid with the problem. Right. And that's probably the answer to your question. Yeah. But I think some people are, are uh, uncomfortable with seeing uh, people cry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is why we always want to hand tissue and we want to go over there and then start to tell them, you got this. Think about when someone passes away, right? And everybody goes to the house. And what do we do? We want to feed them and keep them laughing. Mm -hmm. No, we don't. We, we want to feed them so that they can eat. And we want to keep them laughing sometimes. We want to let them cry. Because what happens when everybody leaves? They cry. They cry, they cry just by themselves. Right. And, and isn't it better to be supported in your pain mm -hmm. than to be alone with it? So even though the lesson may be... Uh, oh God, you guys, it's been a long time. Yes. <laughs> maybe the, the lesson is algebra, but maybe the bigger lesson is human emotion and how to handle it. Because you'll never learn algebra if you can't self-regulate and you can't evaluate how you feel and you don't know how to move past your hurt, disappointment, and anger. Because remember we said you can't learn when you're feeling this way? Like how do you learn when you feel this way? So of course, because I am a clinician, I believe in letting the tears flow. Why? Because tears are cleansing and therapeutic, right? So a lot of times when I do workshops, um, I put these labels on the back of the tissue boxes. I'll put, I'll put like little tissue packets in like the little bags that they get, and there's a label on them that says tears are therapeutic. <laughs> cry. Right? Because they are. Like after you have a good cry, how do you feel? <laughs> Oh my gosh. It's almost like it's almost like you've been holding it all day. And then you go to the bathroom and you just go like, oh. Oh my goodness. Like I cannot believe that I've been holding that in all day. Sorry, y'all. I mean this is just how I normally talk. But right, you've been holding it in all day. How do you walk around holding it in all day? And then as soon as you let it go, it's like you almost want to collapse to the floor because you're so relaxed. Or after you get that good massage, or after you eat a bowl of ice cream, right? Because you just go, oh my God, that was like the best thing ever, right? That's what tears are. So let's talk about why we are here. Black boys cry too, but they do it privately, right? African American males often learn very early that tears are a sign of weakness. Why? But don't, I think all, all boys learn that. White boys learn that too. Because my son's Latino, obviously, but that's something that he learned and it's, it's something that I don't want him to learn. Right. 
So, so can I be honest with you why this one is entitled African American Boys? Because African American boys in this district specifically are struggling the most. When they poll the students and the teachers, they're the ones struggling the most. So it's not that all boys don't cry, and it's not that Latino boys and Middle Eastern boys don't cry and Native American boys, but I'm just saying as a district, when it was polled for your district, they're the ones struggling the most. And then I think about my own brother growing up in a single parent home, he was always told that he was the man of the house or he had that mentality himself, and so mm -hmm. he felt like he had to be strong for everybody else. Right. Um, and so seeing him cry whenever he did was kind of detrimental to my sister and me who were younger, like, okay, something's really, really wrong. Right. Um, so he did keep it to himself and cry. Right. Right. Because it's a sign of weakness. Right? Mm -hmm. So, this is why they cry privately. They are judged first and rarely given the opportunity to prove their accusers wrong. They're perceived as a threat when they express anger and are labeled aggressive and hostile and unable to express themselves appropriately. They're taught to be on alert based on what is going on in this country and because they are judged differently than their peers. So let's talk about the alert part. Yes. Do we have access to this PowerPoint? Um, I will send it to you. I will give you, if you give me your email address, okay. I will. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, let's talk about being on alert. <laughs> so, the truth of the matter is, it's little black boys that are being killed at 12 and 13 years old. 11, 10. So I'm going to be honest with you as a mom, you know the, you know the conversation I have with my son? I teach him when he walks out the door to be on alert. We have the talk. Y'all seen those commercials? Yeah. I'm a Grey's Anatomy fan. And when they had the talk, that whole episode, I mean, just heartbreaking. Because I thought, and I'm a mom first and a clinician second, you guys, and a speaker last. So if I get a little emotional with this, don't forgive me. It's just how it is. Um, the talk. Because I have to tell him to be on alert. Who wants to tell their kid that? I don't, but I have to. I have to teach them that. And see, as the educators, you have to understand that that is what they're up against. You can't ignore that. How do you ignore that? Right? Because every time a shooting happens, and a little boy that looks like my son is killed, guess what I do? I have to talk with him again. And so that probably affects them for the rest of his day, his week. And so his teachers may catch him at a moment where he's thinking about, man, what was that? What if that had been me or my friends or one of my cousins, right? Because that can't be ignored, right? It can't be ignored that they're judged differently than their peers. Right? Like, we're, we're, we're going to be honest, right? It cannot be ignored. Because that's the truth, isn't it? In our society, isn't that the truth? That black boys are judged and treated differently. When they're upset, they're seen as hostile and aggressive and as a threat and as not knowing how to express themselves appropriately. Is that not the truth? It's true. So this is why one of the reasons they don't cry, they suck it up. Or they do it privately. Right? This is why they do it privately. This is why it's so important to create safe spaces and opportunities for them to be able to come in and say, hey, Tamar Rice looks like me. And I'm scared. And I'm scared. A lot of little boys that look like my son, they don't like the cops. And when I say they don't like them, I don't mean like, oh, I can't stand police. They're afraid of them. They don't find encouragement when they see them drive by. It grips them with fear. We cannot ignore that. And so when we wonder why black boys respond the way they do, we have to understand why they're responding the way they do. 
right? It doesn't matter that my son comes from upper or middle class parents. That does not matter because when he walks out the door, even though that's what you guys saw, everybody doesn't see that. I've seen the difference as he's gotten older when we go into the airport, right? One specific example, we were in the airport and he got pulled aside and I was like, what? Like he's a kid, but not to them. Not to them. He had his beats, I think, on and you know, his little backpack and you know, and just, and he didn't hear like when they were, you know, instructed him. And I had said, hey, Jay, pull off your ear headphones, you know. And so, but, you know, he's a kid, he's a boy, he don't listen. <laughs> and so, but the way he was handled, I was like, oh, okay. He was handled like a man and not a boy. Just a hard-headed, knuckle-headed boy who didn't listen and didn't take off his, his beats. Right? There's a difference. And so when we want them to respond a certain way, we have to treat them a certain way. We have to think about what's going on in their lives, right? As a clinician, I can't judge. People ask me all the time, what do I think about this? What do I think about that? How do I feel about it? I don't have an opinion. It's not my job to judge you. It's my job to stand with you and to take the journey with you as you figure out how to handle it. But I would love for everybody to have that mindset. But we don't. Right? We judge first and we get data second. What about we collect the data first and then assist them on the journey? But instead, normally we, we go straight straight to the judging. Why do we judge first? Like where where does the judgment come from? Because we're viewing guys their own experience. It's like when you get cut off on the road, you think that guy's an asshole. You don't think like, oh, he might have just been served with divorce papers and lost his two kids. And you don't think about you don't think about the other guy's story. Right. You, you think about your story. Right. We remain egocentric even as adults. Aren't we supposed to grow out of that? That's what children are, right? Children are egocentric. All they see is their perspective, right? Right? Because their experiences are limited. And what happens is as adults, as we get older, our experiences are supposed to broaden our perspectives. But unfortunately for a lot of adults, we stay closed-minded. So this is why black boys cry privately. Because of course they cry. But they can't do it publicly. Because now it's can I trust you in my feelings? Can I let you in? Can I let you see this vulnerable side of me. I have a question for you. Uh-huh. Ninety-five percent of the harm that's done to boys that look like your son are done to him by boys that look like your son. Um, is part of not being vulnerable that? And I know that's how it was with me. I mean, I was raised, it wasn't about people that didn't look like me, the people that looked like me, if I cried, I would be vulnerable and I would be bullied. Mm -hmm. And it was that simple, the way that I grew up. Mm -hmm. um, that's where your son probably learned it as well. well it's I, just, think it, I think it's society as a whole says it, boys can't cry. It, it could be. And I mean, I relate to you, and I, I get that you're doing it for the African-American child right now, and I wanted to hear, mm -hmm. but it relates. I think Latinos, we're not as good as because usually you hear a Latino gets killed, oh, it's a gang. It's a gang. But it's not always a gang. Sure. And my son tells me, and I was shocked to hear that, I mean, we live in a really nice area, everything, that when he and his friends got together and they would sit at the park, they would always be approached by police. I was like, like what? Absolutely. And I, it brought it home to what you're saying, that we had to have that talk. Unfortunately, we had to have that talk, you know? and. And my, my family is, um, is mixed. Mm -hmm. And so that's the talk that we had to have with my um, nephew, who's 16 going on 17. You, you can never talk back to the police. You have to be on your best behavior mm -hmm. because they're going to take it negatively. Whereas your, I'm sorry, but your Caucasian friend could talk back. Mm -hmm. 
he's seen as a kid. You're seen differently. And right. and they saw that because it's very mixed who he hangs with. I must have so. gone up at a different time because we couldn't talk back and Well, but you could talk back and they're gonna be and they're gonna be they're gonna scold you, but they're not gonna throw you on the floor and hang up. I think that's the idea. I think that's I don't think the, the idea, idea is like necessarily what I experienced. I think the idea is okay. And why we're, I would assume why we're all here today is to, to, to try our best to see through somebody else's eyes. Right. Right. So right. I can talk all day about what I experienced right. as a kid. But, it's, but I'm not going to learn anything if I keep doing that. I'm right. only going to learn something if I try to understand somebody else's experience. Right, right. As, oh, well, oh, I have a story to tell about my nephew. He, at this time, he was 13 years old. Um, this is when the Pokemon, everybody's searching for Pokemon. Oh, right, right. Things right. that nature. So he's, it's late. He snuck out of the house at, it was like 10 p.m. My sister, she has to be at work at 3 in the morning, so she goes to bed very early. And so at this, he snuck out of the house and he's looking for Pokemon. She lives in a really nice neighborhood in Rancho Cucamonga. And um, he went to a home and I guess he zapped where Pokemon mm -hmm. was and the video camera caught my nephew. At this time, so now there's flyers going around, have you seen this guy, you know, he's, you know breaking into homes. There was nothing broken into. But, and then he has a straight out of Compton t-shirt on. So now it's like, right, so I don't that movie was out back then, which is really <laughs> hot to wear right there. Yeah. So flyers are going around. And so my sister gets the flyer and she's like, oh my gosh, like this is my son, you know? And so now she goes to the home and she talks, you know, to the people that live at the residence. And she's like, you know what? Like my son is a very good kid. You know, she had him explain his side of the story of what he was doing and at, at that point, it was an eye-opener. They are like, okay, they did say they seen a little black boy, you know, and that's what their camera caught. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it was nothing broken into, but they had flyers going around saying that he was breaking into things. There was nothing reported that right. something was broken into. And so it just happened to be he was a police officer. So he told my sister, had I would have been home that day, I probably would have had my gun out, and I probably would have shot him. And so he was like, and you know, the sad part about it is I pass by your house every day and I see your son, he's outside playing basketball, but I didn't even recognize that that was him. Right. So at that point, it was like, okay, had it would have been another race with this house, which doesn't pass enough fires and saying that the home was... Right, would he have been labeled? It, a label, exactly. Right, right, because how do we go from I caught you on my security cam to the label? How do we jump to that? Preconceived notions, right? Like that's, let's be honest, that's what that is. It's a preconceived notion because how do we go from, you know, security cam to breaking into homes, right? So that fear that people have, right? False evidence appearing real, you guys heard of that? Mm -hmm. Right? Because that's really what it is. It's like you don't have evidence, but it's just, because you felt a certain way. So we respond to our fears, and our fears creates the reaction in these little boys. And I'm gonna be honest with you guys. Um, I do believe that this topic is relevant to all boys, okay? Absolutely. But the thing is, is that all boys are taught this way. Right? But the thing is, is that honestly, Caucasian boys are not viewed the same. So is it relatable to all boys? Absolutely. But if you are honest with yourself, Caucasian boys are not judged the same way that African American boys and Latino boys and Middle Eastern boys and Native American boys with long ponytails and Tongan boys. They're not. The They're not show it. The statistics, statistics show it. They're not. So while this is a wide-reaching topic, let's be honest that we need to be specific when we talk about boys of color because they are treated and judged differently. Well, my, my son was pulled over. He had funny speed. He was pulled over speed. But when he came home to tell the story, he said, and the police were so nice. I, I, you know, so in his head, he was probably thinking, oh my God, they're going to hurt me. But he said, they were so nice, and they were, 
and, and they pardoned his whatever he was they pardoned him speeding and so his whole thing was I had a good experience mm -hmm. with, with authority mm -hmm. but why would you have to say that right why would you have to anybody else catch that what you tell the story mm -hmm. that he felt the need to say that yeah. it's like because if you come home as a parent of a boy of color, immediately when they tell you they got pulled over, your heart drops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they have to, and then he needed to ease, we, 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 he needed to ease you, and he said, but they were nice. Like, is that supposed to be the norm? <laughs> Being nice is supposed to be the norm. Be. But we react, even as parents of color, we react because we know what's going on in society. And so... If we look at it in reverse, our fear teaches them how to react. But it's sad that our fear is real, and so now they react off of our fear. You guys catch that? It would be great if we didn't have to fear anything, so then they wouldn't have to be reactive off of our fear. But that's not a reality. So again, we come back to safe spaces. This is why we want to understand why black boys cry. This is why we want to understand why they cry privately and we want to understand their experience because we need to create safe spaces, right? And so, of course, me as a clinician, the way I create safe spaces is not the way you as educators create safe spaces. But I want you to think about how do you create safe spaces or how can you go about creating the safe spaces? Because that is what's important. Right? So we started out with them crying, why they cry privately, what their experience is like, and the result is, what we want to get to is being able to do this. So I want to read you guys something. So earlier this year, I did an event called Love Fest at Valley College, and I invited junior high, middle school children, and we had workshops um, ran by clinicians on the topics of helpless and hopeless and being young and vocal and vulnerable. And so I got this letter um, from a young man. Um, and so when I was asked to speak today, I reached out to him and I asked if I could share his letter. Okay? So can I get you guys all to close your eyes? Okay. If you're reading this, it means that I trust you immensely. Please do not jump to conclusions, as I am not in danger, nor am I suicidal. I want to share something with you. I should be dead. Not too long ago, I had a knife to my throat, and I was ready to slit my throat, but my dog pushed my door open and startled me. It was a blessing and a curse. One part of me wanted to die, and the other wanted to live. That's the day I learned to separate my real from my reality. My real is always asking, why did I expect them to have my best interest at heart when they never had it? My reality says they love and care for you. I am not mentally stable. I have cried myself to sleep for the past year almost. I do not understand the pain, joy, or hurt throughout the day until night comes and when I am in the shower or go to sleep. That is when I get what I did. I had a knife to my throat and was ready to take my own life. I need to find me. I need to figure out how to handle the sadness caused by some very traumatic things that have happened to me over the last year and a half. I decided to reach out to you because during Love Fest, you shared the importance of being able to express our feelings, and honestly, there's not very many people that make me feel as comfortable as you did that day. Prior to meeting you, since this great sadness has come over me, my grades have slipped, and I no longer found joy in anything. I attempted to explain to my teachers what was going on with me when they would question me about my sudden angry disposition. Yet when all they saw was anger and not the great sadness, I gave up trying to get them to understand me. How could they only see anger? How could they accuse me of being an angry person and not take the time to hear me when I was trying to explain how sad I am? So when I met you and I heard you speak, I decided that you were someone I could trust. You are a safe space for me to share my sadness. You made the statement that therapy is dope because loving you is dope. So I made the decision to tell my parents I wanted to get help. I want to learn how to deal with my sadness 
and I want to not be tempted to take my own life again. Thank you again for putting together Love Fest, and thank you for empowering myself and all those that attended to stand up for ourselves by seeking out safe spaces to share our feelings and express our sadness and pain. Thank you. So this is why I do what I do, right? So of course when I got that letter, my immediate thought was, thank God he was there. And then my other response was to keep doing what I do, to keep creating those safe spaces for children, to keep allowing them the space and the opportunity to express that. Because what if he never came to that event? What if he didn't come? Then what? He would have tried again, right? Because his, in his mind, we talk about you know suicide, right? And being able to recognize that oh, he had a plan. He had a plan, and he was already in the process of enacting the plan. But what stopped him? His dog. Not like how cute his dog was, but because the dog just kind of interrupted him. And had he not had a safe space to express that, I would have probably been getting notice that he had taken his own life. Right? So. This idea of creating safe spaces, this idea of empowering them to tell their truth and to speak their truth and to talk about why they feel the way they do, that, if you don't take anything away from today, right, if I completely bored you out of your mind and you think, well, that was an hour and a half that I could have got back, you know, if I wanted, you know, to do something else with my time, but if you don't take anything else away from that, just remember that it's your job to create the safe spaces. And you have to figure out how to craft that, right? I can't tell you, you need to do it this way, and you gotta do it this way. It's for you to figure it out, but it's important. Um, there was a key line in that letter that I noticed. That he actually said, you, thank you for being a safe space. Yeah. So it almost says, yes, we need to create, but we are actually the safe space. Yeah, we are. We are, because it's a village, right? We talk about the village. So if the parents are creating safe spaces, and the educators are creating safe spaces, and the community events that they're involved in are creating safe spaces, and their teams and their coaches, oh my goodness, could you imagine how much more amazing our children would be? Could you imagine a world where children felt safe to cry and to express themselves and to be vulnerable and to say they're not okay? They would, they would grow to be adults who knew how to handle themselves better, right? I have total empathy for all my clients, but I probably have way more empathy for the children because as adults, you're supposed to know better. But the problem is, is that these safe spaces usually aren't created for us as adults to be able to say we're okay. You know, we didn't learn that as children, and so now we grow up and we don't talk about it. So then we don't think about creating the safe spaces for children to be able to say they're not okay. Right? It doesn't even come to mind. Because as adults, we struggle with it. Right? If you think about your home, your work environment, is it a safe space for you to express that you're not okay? Depends who you're around. Yeah. It's really about the people. Yeah. Right? And a lot of times as adults, do we remove ourselves from environments that are not safe spaces? A lot of times we don't. We stay in relationships, we stay at jobs, we stay involved in organizations that do not create safe spaces. So we don't even think about doing it for our children. Do you guys want to know the twist to all this? So the topic was about children. But the truth of the matter is, I wanted to teach you guys the mindset of how you see your own life and how you view the way you do things. Because if you start to think about your own self-care, if you start to think about creating safe spaces for yourself, you'll automatically do it for the children. Right? It becomes an automatic thing. Right? If you think about protecting your peace, 
And if you automatically think about protecting yourself and how you can be vulnerable and where you can't be vulnerable, you then become the change. And then you start to create these spaces and you start to create these opportunities for others because you know how to protect your own peace. Y'all catch that or did I just go? Did I just kind of flip it all the way around for you guys. Right? Because my biggest thing is self-care. I always tell clients, oh my goodness, if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't take care of other people. It's a bit more that. That brought something to mind for me. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, uh, society in general before it kind of, uh, you know, taught you ignore your feelings, suck it up, do what you have to do. You know, now we're looking at, okay, mental health is important, knowing why people feel the way they do or act the way they do is important. Mm -hmm. So you have parents who don't know how to teach their kids or, you know, train their kids properly, and then they're sending them to us. And so our school model, it probably should be changed so that maybe at a younger age, the kids are learning about their feelings and yes. what we've been discussing today. Yes. Because right now it's just perpetuating over and over. And right. Over. Right. A lot of stuff. right, because if when they're younger, if we teach them to express their feelings and we teach them to communicate how they feel, as they get older, they'll be responsive as opposed to being reactionary. Right? It's all in how we train them up. Right? But for those who are with middle schoolers or with high schoolers, and so you kind of miss that opportunity to kind of train them up, so now we talk about we want to make sure we create the safe space. Whether you're the safe space, whether your classroom is a safe space, probably one of my favorite classes when I was in high school um, was my English teacher. Like she had couches and beanbag chairs and all these different things and like it was just comfortable like the environment was comfortable and and you know what honestly no one ever fell asleep in her class even though you know it was it was it felt like we could but we didn't because we were just comfortable that atmosphere was comfortable and it's crazy because she is one of the teachers that as years came by and I would like sit back and think, she was one of the teachers that always had students reaching out to her to talk, to share, to, it was, it was usually her. Why is that? She created the safe space. She created a comfortable environment, right? And everyone has their own way of doing it. Like, you know, everyone figures it out. That's all I got for y'all. I know it's supposed to go until 1045, but that's all I got.